So, dear listeners, welcome to the first FM podcast where we'll be talking about the evolving market structure in crypto. And today we have a really exceptional guest, Doug Atkin, who has spent over 40 years in the capital markets, starting with one of the leading electronic trading brokers, or actually the leading electronic trading brokers, Instanet, and then spending, I guess, almost the exact same time on the buy side and the venture side, on the market data and research side. And uh, we're truly honored to have you here for our first podcast. Well, thanks, Constantine. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, we appreciate you being one of the stars of our uh, limited partner meeting uh, yesterday. And we're just so impressed with you and the team and what you're building. So today, I want to talk about the market structure that involved in the equity space because there is one philosophical concept that tells that creativity and creation of something is one of the later stages of education. And without knowing the prior experience, it's sometimes hard to build something new and innovational. So you need to learn from the past, you need to get the best practices out of the, what, what's already was built and implement some of the innovation on top of that. And I think Instanet and basically what you did um, with Instanet was truly innovational for the equities and the whole electronic trading space. Appreciate that. So let's start with the first question is, uh, can you tell me a bit more about the beginning of the electronic trading industry and the role that Instanet played in it? Yeah, sure. So um, I started at Instanet in 1984, but Instanet was started in 1969. And I think this, I mean, easily the first fintech company, probably by 25 years. So uh, I was really fortunate. Um, you know, it's one of those great uh, forks in the road where I chose my first job and yeah. had an opportunity to go to an investment bank or this little startup called Instanet where I was the 22nd employee. But uh, as I said, Instanet was founded in 1969 uh, by uh, a real innovator, two real innovators. One was a specialist on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange, a competitor to the New York Stock Exchange. And another was just, not just, a technologist. And what they tried to do, their first innovation was building an electronic uh, ticker tape. You know, everyone takes for granted there's a ticker tape, but, yeah. uh, or electronic uh, feed of prices from the various exchanges. But that didn't used to be, and they created the first electronic uh, ticker, that which was a major innovation. Internet really didn't start trading in equities until the mid '70s, and it was uh, tough going. Um, there was uh, what changed in 1975 was the SEC coming out with rules that, in essence, lowered commissions and deregulated yep. them, and that was. Um, sort of what saved Instanet, but it um, it really didn't do much. Uh, and when I started, Instanet was trading about 500,000 shares a wow. day only. So going back to the innovation on the ticker tape, I guess it was, well, it was the first digital uh, market data system in, this, in, the, in the time. So how did you apply that innovation and made sure that it was properly distributed across your client base. So I guess it was quite a challenge because no one was ever using something like that. Yeah, I mean, first uh, the professionals used it because they were the only ones who were really equipped. There was no, obviously, internet. There was no way to distribute those prices to retail investors. Believe it or not, there was a time when there wasn't internet. Um, and so the first people to use it uh, were the people on the exchange floor who really didn't know what was going on on the other side of the yep. exchange floor. And then there were three or four exchanges back then to trade IBM or AT&T or GE, what we now call the New York listed stocks. And they wanted to see what was going on uh, at, their, at the other exchanges. Wow. So... The, the, the way from the market data electronification to trading took almost like 10 years. Yeah. So how did you see that path evolving? Was it mainly driven by some of the demand on the client? So can you tell a bit more about the way the company did to actually introduce the trading part? Yeah. Um, 
as I said, it, it, it took a long time. Uh, Incident always wanted to be a trading system. Uh, the technology at the time, uh, be even before the green screens, were these big machines uh, that you would literally type the yeah. prices into, and they shook up and down. And the way you entered an order back then was to type into this you know, huge machine that had paper going through it, and that was distributed to, <laughs> to the marketplaces. I guess you can see that machine in the Wall Street Museum, I think. I yeah. Saw something like that. You yeah. can <laughs> see that. And the, and the computers were, um, whatever, uh, for technologists who were historians, PDP-11s that were the, basically the size of this room. Never seen anything in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll, say, I'll show you a picture. <laughs> Sounds great. So... In terms of any inflection points for Instanet, what do you think was one of the major breakthroughs? Whether the introduction of the, the DMA as you did it or any other milestones that, that you can highlight? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, there were a few along the way. Um, the first uh, was just creating the ticker. The second was uh, you know, with regulations changing and commissions in essence being deregulated, that's when the infancy, as I said, 500,000 shares trading between a day, you know, between 1969 and 1984 or 1983. Yeah. The big innovation for Instanet was when we began to trade NASDAQ stocks. And the key difference between trading New York Stock Exchange stocks and NASDAQ stocks, and this is, you know, there's a perfect analog uh, for crypto, was the New York Stock Exchange had 100% of the volume. So it was a liquidity pool where everyone met. And as you know, the marketplace business is, is you need a lot of liquidity before anyone gets a lot of value out of Get the gravitational the pool, ball. this whole chicken and egg thing. Absolutely. This is, yeah, exactly. No what doubt. Any venue should go through. So New York already had that, yep. albeit not in an electronic fashion. However, if you have it, it's really hard to pull it away. So Incident had very low market share uh, in New York Stock Exchange stocks, even into the 90s. What we began to do in 1984 we're trading NASDAQ stocks. And NASDAQ's market structure was a lot different uh, than the New York Stock Exchange. And is actually a bit more like crypto or very much like crypto. So the best way to explain the NASDAQ market structure is instead of one floor, what, you, what NASDAQ did was operated, if you put it in sort of physical terms, uh, I don't know, fish market, right, where everyone pulled up their stalls, each broker. So NASDAQ, uh, excuse me, Merrill Lynch would sell fish at one price and Morgan Stanley would sell fish at another price, but it was one-on-one -on -one negotiation. And what Instanet did is created an electronic liquidity pool. So where people could now meet in one place much more effectively to trade NASDAQ stocks. So that was really, I would say, this the key inflection point. And this was basically extent. the democratization of uh, access to the, to the markets, I guess, at, at a certain extent. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely. It evolved there. Yep. Um, really, what happened when we began to trade NASDAQ stocks, it was the people in the fish market who saw the value, right? So um, basically, uh, what would happen are the big brokerage firms uh, would all be trading on Instanet, but the public and even the fund managers at the time, fund managers just didn't want it. They, they didn't have the skill set. They said they traded for free. Uh, so the people who used it were the big brokerage firms. And it created, in essence, an interdealer broker, not on purpose. We always wanted the public and the fund managers to get access to our prices. The first people to use it were the big brokers. And what they would do is quote out to the public, let's say in Intel, they would quote $15 bid, 15 and a half offer. So fund managers and the public, if you were selling, would sell at 15. If you were buying, you'd sell at 15 and a half. But on Instanet, there was a 15 and an eighth. I'm now talking 
fractions, which don't, you know, this was before you could trade in pennies. So let's say 1525 bid instead of 15 bid. And so a, a market maker could buy at 15 from a fund manager and risk free trade at 1525 on Instant. Yeah, well, I guess this was also improving the like the, the cost efficiency. So the clients should have appreciated that by by the time it was mainly mainly adopted. Yeah, and and look, uh, it takes a certain skill set um, to trade electronically. And if you think about it, yep. no one had computers back then. Uh, so traders at fund management organizations were basically order clerks. So their fund managers would say, buy 10,000 Intel or buy 10,000 IBM. He or she would pick up the phone, basically he back then, and would just hand the order off uh, to the brokerage firm. And you know, going back to our example, if they were buying 10,000 shares of Intel and they saw 15 and a half offered in the market, their broker would yep. sell them stock at 15 and a half. Now, it took a long time to educate the buy side, the fund managers. Um, it happened slowly. There are certainly in any industry some key innovators. Um, so there were three or four fund managers, heads of trading at fund managers, who immediately saw the obvious benefit <laughs> Sure. Instead of buying stock uh, at fifteen and a half, you could buy a uh, stock at fifteen twenty five and pay instant at five cents a share. So it's pretty obvious. Yet um, people, we gave people a cockpit. Yep. Right, and people weren't ready to uh, enjoy. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, they, they felt it was dangerous. It. Right. Makes sense. So one thing, one thing that is quite different, I guess, from the current crypto market structure is the fragmentation of the markets. So back 20 years ago, or like 25 years ago, the market was dominant, the US equities market was dominant by a couple of exchanges. Yes. And um, since then, US equity markets were extremely fragmented. So what do you think are the main drivers for fragmentation? And how do you see that might be similar? Or do you see the trend is going to be even more fragmented? Or do you see any consolidation there? Yeah, great question. So regulation created consolidation or fragmentation, I should say, in in the U.S. Um, for good or bad, one could argue, running a marketplace with 100 percent, you know, let's just say electronic uh, market share, and Instanet got up to 35 percent of all Nasdaq wow. trading yeah. at its peak. Um, uh, we we liked. Uh, uh, not, I mean, we were heavily regulated in what we could do, but um, it was our own private liquidity pool, and we allowed in professional traders uh, only, both the buy side and the sell side. But people, uh, the SEC and some investment banks or brokers who saw Instanet as a deep threat, convinced the regulators to basically put some regulations in place, I don't want to get you know, too in the, in the weeds, that in essence created the opportunity for new exchanges to form and yep. not have to build their own liquidity. Um, that led to massive fragmentation in the market, again, for good or bad. So uh, I how many hundreds of crypto exchanges are there? I guess just on the like a main like coin market cap website, there are probably like around six hundred exchanges. Yeah, but in reality, there are way more than that. And yeah, the the crypto today is probably the most fragmented asset class in the human history. I mean, it's it's incredible. So even today in the equities market, I think there's thirty places to trade Intel. Right yeah. now, you have six hundred marketplaces, um, and when you have six hundred marketplaces. Uh, you know, we would argue that that's not a great market structure uh, in general. Uh, but what's needed, and going back to, um, you know, in essence, the premise of this conversation is how to how does crypto evolve in a similar fashion uh, as the equity markets evolved? One, when you have, when you go from one liquidity pool that has 100% of the market to 40 fragmented liquidity pools in equities, 
to 600 <laughs> in crypto. I didn't know it was that many. I knew it was a lot. We start we uh, we stopped counting. I think at a couple hundred um, when we started to look at at the real benefits of your business. So what's needed when there's fragmentation is if you're a customer. Uh, you want to go to one place that gets access to as many liquidity pools as possible. And in some ways, an analog is uh, the kayak kayak.coms or the Travagas or the Expedias, exactly. right? Why go and spend all the time uh, to go on the website to see just each airline's price when you can go on an aggregator. So basically, the, the best answer to any fragmentation is a marketplace concept where you can connect multiple pools of liquidity. And um, I might just add there, we'll see even more fragmentation, which will be uh, driven by the regulation. Uh, right now, we have 600 venues. Most of them, or a huge portion of them, is still offshore. But for any crypto exchange that want to serve the local clientele, whether it's Europe, Canada, or uh, any any Asian country, right now they need to establish a local presence. Yeah, and th that will be driving a next wave of fragmentation. Which m might there might be a case <laughs> that in in a few years we'll see like more than more than a thousand local exchanges, and I, I guess some of the smaller venues will be forced to pivot into more of a smart order routing broker, mm -hmm. brokers operating the smart order routers without trying to operate their own pool. Ab absolutely, and that's a great business for people who have the technology. And I would just say, um, you know, stepping back from Communitas, and Communitas is a venture firm. I'm uh, one of the three co-founders. I obviously ran Instanet, my two colleagues, uh, one ran Tom Gloser, who ran Reuters, obviously huge data, financial data provider, FX trading exactly. as well, um, and Duncan Niederauer, who ran the New York Stock Exchange. So we don't know a lot about a lot of things, but you know, we've, we've just spent a lot of time in marketplaces. We see one business plan a week, for marketplace trading businesses. And by and large, we throw them out. Uh, uh, when you showed up with your business, uh, we said, this is a really interesting business. And precisely because of the way equity has evolved. Yep. So we love the way that you are aggregating various liquidity pools, particularly for fund managers who need uh, one, instant execution. They need to know what the price is and you need to execute off that, that price. With the proper depth as well. Exactly, yeah. and the proper depth. And yeah, again, without getting into the weeds, the way you've not only aggregated the different liquidity pools, be it you know, marketplaces and the, the market-making firms, yep. similar to the old NASDAQ market-making firms, in a way uh, where everyone gets their, in essence, their customized order book based on who they're allowed to trade with, who they want to trade with. And that is just, a, in our opinion, a brilliant innovation. And then, look, I'm not paid to say this, but uh, you know, Constantine is, is uh, clearly a domain expert. Um, and is building what we think is a transformational business. Appreciate the feedback, and uh, we just we're just starting, so we'll. <laughs> I, I hear you, but we're excited. <laughs> Sounds great. So going back to the conversation of uh, smart order routing, Instanet was also the first uh, institution to launch such a concept. Yes. Can you tell a bit more about how did it operate back then, and what was also driving that decision? Yeah. Uh, just going back to, in essence, what I well, what I said earlier, Instanet built its own marketplace, closed marketplace, which uh, people had to come to directly. Once new regulation came in, that in essence forced uh, fragmentation. If you're a customer of Instanet, and most of the liquidity is in your own private, in our own private liquidity pool. You don't need to send the order flow anywhere else, right? But once there was fragmentation, uh, there were other marketplaces that were developing their own uh, volume. And for the good of our customers, we had to develop uh, a place where 
Uh, you came to Instanet first. If we couldn't get you the best price on Instanet, we would route your order to the marketplace that did have the best price. But believe me, we, we, uh, it was out of necessity, uh, uh, not uh, desire. <laughs> so in terms of the volume split, so do you remember how was that in evolving into the flow that was executed within Instanet versus the smart order router? Yeah, as I said, in its, uh, at its, I would say before smart order routing, um, Instanet was at about 30% market share. Uh, we, when we started smart order routing, uh, we got up to about 35% market share. But again, for various reasons, uh, largely the big banks lobbying the SEC to change the rules you know, to harm Instanet, our commissions compressed. Yep. Uh, in a significant manner, as as we were talking, uh, it was basically close to eighty percent over a weekend. Our uh, commissions compressed, um, and that was due to if we could send orders to other marketplaces, even though we had the biggest liquidity, largest pool of liquidity, people with no liquidity could send orders to our marketplace, <laughs> right? <laughs> for, and for regulatory reasons, they could do it at a fraction of the cost that uh, we were charging. And again, we, you know, it, that might come across of, wow, you were ripping off your clients, far from it. As I said before, the fidelities of the world pre-Instanet, going back to the Intel example, we're trading uh, we're buying. We're buying Intel at fifteen dollars and fifty cents. Instanet would have an offer at fifteen twenty-five. So they were buying at fifteen twenty-five and paying us, let's say, five cents. Yep. What happened uh, with this uh, smart order routing and fragmentation is our commissions went down to one cent. Wow, interesting. So which people would die to receive <laughs> at this point? Exactly, exactly. And I, I guess this trend is uh, And this is a exactly huge trend similar, in, yeah. in crypto. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the reasons, Constantine, that, that we stay away from these types of uh, the, the vanilla business models, um, and we, you know, we love the innovation that, that you're providing, is it's a race to the bottom on commissions. So look, Coinbase is a great company, but uh, when I first started trading on Coinbase, you basically said, I want to buy $100 worth of Bitcoin, and you type that in, and you didn't know what price you were getting, you didn't know, the, like, the, you barely knew the commission, and, you know, it was costing probably around 8 to 10%. Yeah, which is insane. But today it already compressed and that definitely will continue. Exactly. That's why we see the, the, the largest value add should be not on the uh, like a commoditized execution thing, but more on the infrastructural side of things with proper risk management tools um, and like clearing post trade settlement. Absolutely. This is where the industry is actually still trying to figure out the most efficient way. And this is probably from the like the discussion of the modern days is the whole US market is transitioning from T plus uh, two to T plus one. And we are seeing that it already triggers a ton of challenges for the industry. While crypto, it's like it's by design, like a T zero trade. Yes. Well, certain liquidity providers or market makers, they do settle T plus one, but there is no uh, unofficial market standard for clearing and settlement. And that what we are also trying to help solve to some of our clients is basically define the rules within the infrastructure that would simplify and tailor the clearing and settlement process. Yeah, and again, um, absolutely. And that's, I mean, there's a roadmap clearly for how to make crypto uh, let's just say more institutionalized, and it needs to get there if you don't have the things that you are building and taking leadership on. Um, if you don't have standardized settlement, standardized, you know, I would argue regulation, clearing, clearing systems, uh, KYC, know your customer, um, you know what, bad stuff happens, and in our opinion, 
uh, not having this core infrastructure uh, is one of the main reasons there have been blow-ups in, in the crypto markets. I guess we'll see a few more because the, the industry is still evolving. No doubt. We'll, we'll definitely see a few more. The good news is uh, innovative firms like yourselves are seeing the benefit not only from your own business, a business perspective, but uh, it's needed for the marketplace to grow. And uh, it's, it's definitely needed. And um, I think we're getting there. Uh, you know, your firm is, is one of the firms that we love in building out this infrastructure and sanity <laughs> to the marketplace. But, in, you know, unless that happens, if you're trading on exchange number 489, uh, there's some risk, let's just put it that way. For sure, yeah. for sure. There's no free lunch for no. for the retail investors. No, yeah. not at all. Thank you. So one other important thing as uh, I wanted to, to, to discuss with you, with your term with Instanet, you also had a quite a significant milestone as uh, going public. And the IPO of the uh, trading venue might be quite controversial. There is a, a discussion that going public for a company that operates a trading venue might potentially create a conflict of interest between the investors and the market participants so that you balance the value you bring to your participants versus the uh, shareholder value that you need to create as a CEO. So it'd be great to hear your opinion, not on just on the internet, but on any trading venue going public. How do you feel if, if that conflict exists? And if yes, uh, how do you think it should be better mitigated? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting issue and very interesting question. And I think there's, if you don't mind, there's a, sort of a number of different angles, uh, to uh, lenses to look at this through. So the first lens is uh, the traditional stock exchanges. The New York Stock Exchange, for example, uh, there were... They were called seats. Uh, you owned a seat, which is in some ways like a taxi medallion, that there's only a limited number of people, of seats. Um, and they fluctuated in price uh, depending on any number of things. Um, but the whole point of the exchange and all the rules were to drive value to the members by definition, right? Yeah. If the members owned 100% of the exchange, um, by definition, all of the rules, it's out of self-interest. So I would argue that market or ownership structure was definitely not good for the retail investor, right? If you're a trading firm that owns uh, a seat, uh, you do not want you want to make as much profit off of each trade as you can, and therefore, you know, it's, it's obvious that the retail investor uh, was not very, uh, was, uh, was let's not the say, beneficiary. Yeah, the exactly. Stuff, yeah. It was in top of mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, you went from there, and then you did have Instanet, which came in and really upset the Apple cart. Although you could argue, I mean, Instanet was owned uh, first by private shareholders, uh, and then Thomson Reuters, or Reuters bought Instanet. But the way Instanet made money, because we didn't commit capital to trade, right, stocks, we just provided as, you know, as, as crazy as it sounds, it was revolutionary to create the eBay for stocks, yeah. right? <laughs> just revolutionary. So what we wanted to do is create as much volume on our exchange which by definition was transparent, right? Yep. And that saved people money. And that's how we drove value to our shareholders. Now, what happened though, is people who had a lot of liquidity or let's say market share of their own and were trading on Instanet, they said, wait a second, in the old days when I traded, all the benefit was going to my firm, now I'm paying you, yep. and all the benefit is going to your firm. You know what? Uh, I want to buy a piece of Instanet to get the benefit yep. of my trading flow. And if you don't sell it to me, uh, we're going to get together and create our own Instanet. 
And while the buck stops here, meaning me as CEO, definitely, I couldn't convince my parent company to sell pieces of, of Instanet to the other liquidity providers. So um, I think looking at it through another lens, the best way to build a marketplace, because it's hard to get this confluence of liquidity, is to have the people with the liquidity or the firms with the liquidity own a piece of the marketplace, uh, but not the entire marketplace, right? That um, you, you can own a piece, you'll get economic benefit, but you can't control it because if the dealers controlled it, it would sort of drift back to um, uh, the old days. So, I'm sorry for this being a, a long-winded no, this answer. Is, this is a perfect, perfect answer. Yeah. Think, yeah. So, um, so now we go to going public, and I would argue um, having uh, other shareholders, public shareholders, own pieces of the marketplace is really beneficial because they want. It's a competitive industry. Uh, they want their profits to grow. But in a world of fragmentation and competition, what you can't do is really increase your trading fees. Yep. So you need to make it up on volume. And by definition, you, you need to lower the friction costs and trading costs to increase volume, which provides benefit <laughs> to the investors. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated chicken and egg uh, yes. situation, which yeah, every venue or a marketplace needs to p balance and play around. Exactly. With. So, um, and you know, with your with with your business model in the marketplace, uh, that's not necessary. In that you're not building, in essence, your own exchange. You're building the middleware, the technology that provides access yep. uh, to the various liquidity pools. So it's just a different model, in and our opinion. Strategically, what we think is that the infrastructural part, like the added value besides execution, that's what will be driving the most interest. And that's what we already see from our clients because yes. execution is commoditized. Yes. With 600 venues, it is a commodity. Yeah. So the, th the like majority of our clients that joined finery markets, they find it very helpful that it's not just the access to liquidity, but actually the infrastructure absolutely. for them to drive their and business. And absolutely. And I, I, I should have mentioned that. Um, and uh, you run the business, we're only small shareholders, but given that aspect of your business, it might make sense uh, for participants to own a piece yeah. of your business at one point. That Yeah, we'll definitely have a chat and get your advice <laughs> to properly structure. structure yeah, maybe it. we won't do that on a yeah. podcast, but uh, uh, you're in a great position no matter what. Sounds great. And Doug, lastly, it'd be like, I think we had a very productive conversations that our listeners would, would appreciate and learning from all of the innovations that, that Instanet was introducing. How would you summarize some of the key lessons that you've learned throughout your entire career across like all of the firms that you were working with and leading? And how do you think these lessons might be applicable for the crypto industry and like the emerging market structure in crypto? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, what's nice well, there's a lot of things that are not nice about being old, but one of the things in business is to, again, see these patterns develop. And in this era of obviously, you know, increasingly more powerful technology uh, that build marketplaces, link the exchanges together, um, it's only, this is going only in one direction, and that is to benefit retail investors. So when mar when asset classes first start, all of the value goes to the members and to the people running the casino, so to speak. And then what, what happens for those people to compete is you need to lower prices, right? You need, as we've been talking about, and you know, again, your firm is playing a very interesting role in building core infrastructure, and that provides trust. Right, you don't want to trade an asset class where one of the top exchanges in the world blows up. Right, exactly. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't have that. What's really nice is to see the resurgence of crypto 
And with that has come the understanding that you actually need this stuff, right? In order for the markets to operate more efficiently for the purpose of benefiting investors, because at the end of the day, that's what drives an asset class's success. I think that's a perfect summary. And Doug, once again, thanks for being with us for our first podcast. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's been an honor and congrats again, Constantine, on, on all your success. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. Great.